It's not like when the, when the United States exports inflation to another country that hoards dollars. It's not like that inflation goes away. It's still there, right? And when the, when the dollar hyperinflates at home, then what happens to all these other countries that were hoarding dollars the whole time and all of a sudden they see that the dollars aren't worth anything? Well, they reverse the process very quickly. They sell the dollars back to the United States and everything that was exported, all the inflation that's been exported, just gets dumped onto U.S. shores very quickly. And then the, the, the dollar You're watching Silver News Daily. Like this video and subscribe to the channel for the best news that you don't want to miss. Now let's get straight to it. Let's dive into the world of Rafa Farber and his groundbreaking prediction that the price of silver is on the verge of skyrocketing to an unprecedented $2,388 in 2024. This prediction isn't just a wild guess. It's backed by a meticulous analysis of market dynamics, historical trends, and a deep understanding of monetary policy's impact on precious metals. Farbert, known for his keen insights into the precious metals market, has been a vocal advocate for the inherent value of silver, not just as a hedge against inflation, but as a cornerstone of wealth preservation. Rafi Farber's approach to silver is fundamentally different. He sees it not just as an investment, but as the embodiment of real, enduring wealth. His prediction hinges on a series of interlinked factors that are set to propel silver to heights unseen. Key among these is the global economic environment, characterized by rampant inflation and diminishing confidence in fiat currencies. Farber points out that unlike paper money, silver's value doesn't hinge on government decree, but on its tangible qualities and wide-ranging industrial applications, from electronics to solar panels. The current financial landscape, marked by the erosion of purchasing power due to inflation, sets the stage for a renewed appreciation of tangible assets like silver. Farber's analysis suggests that as more people wake up to the realities of fiat currency devaluation, the shift towards silver will accelerate, driven not only by its traditional role as a store of value, but also by its increasing industrial demand, particularly in the green technology sector. Moreover, Farber delves into the technical aspects of the silver market, highlighting its historical volatility and the factors that contribute to its price fluctuations. He notes that silver's dual role as both an industrial metal and a precious metal places it in a unique position to benefit from both economic growth and times of financial uncertainty. This dual role, coupled with the metal's relatively small market size, means that even modest increases in demand can lead to significant price movements. In his interviews and articles, Farber frequently references the impact of monetary policy on silver prices. He points out that the expansionary policies adopted by central banks around the world have led to an increase in the money supply, which historically has been a bullish sign for precious metals. As central banks continue to print money in an effort to stimulate economies, the inherent value of tangible assets like silver becomes increasingly apparent. Another critical aspect of Farber's prediction is the potential for a silver shortage. He cites growing industrial demand, particularly from the renewable energy sector, and stagnant or declining production levels as key factors that could lead to a supply crunch. This imbalance between supply and demand is a classic recipe for higher prices, and Farber suggests that we may be on the cusp of such a scenario in the silver market. Farber's conviction in silver's potential is not just about economic trends and market analysis. It's also rooted in a philosophical belief in the metal's enduring value. He often contrasts silver with fiat currencies, noting that while paper money can be created out of thin air, silver must be mined and refined, a process that requires significant effort and resources. This intrinsic value, Farber argues, will become increasingly important as people seek stability and security in an uncertain economic environment. Yeah, so there's two ways to look at this issue of the bank term funding program uh, ending. And it's going to end gradually. It doesn't end on, uh, in terms of the money being paid back, it's not all on one day, but most of it, or like maybe 60, 70% of it is going to be paid back by the end of April, something like that. So I think it's like 80, maybe $90 billion worth of it. And I think the total outstanding is like 165 billion. I might be a little off on those numbers, but it's in that ballpark. Uh, so one way to look at it uh, in the narrow way, and that not not the way that I'm focusing on, is that oh, these banks they got bailed out, and now they're going to have to take these assets back onto their balance sheet, these underwater treasuries, right? And the treasuries that they sold to the Fed at par, uh, which means the, the amount that you would get on maturity for that for that bond, um, the they are worth even less now than they were back then. Uh, not on every single basis. I'm sure there are some that are worth more, but like in general, interest rates are higher now than they were in March 2023. So that means generally they'll be even more underwater now than they were when they had to be bailed out. 
So that could be a problem for those specific banks that were bailed out, and we could start seeing problems in those specific banks again. But that's a that's like a narrow read, and there has been more liquidity lately, and stocks are up, and all these paper assets are up. So the, the, these banks that were bailed out have benefited from that. So I don't expect immediate trouble for the banks that have to buy back the assets. It's a more of a global concern in terms of uh, the monetary base itself that when all this cash is paid back into the Fed – and and the banks get back their underwater assets, the cash goes out of existence, and then the, the monetary base shrinks. And from there, you could have problems in the plumbing, like uh, the, the the repo market, which is, uh, I think, uh, now it's like $1.8, $1.9 trillion a day. Uh, so we have the bank term funding program ending, plus um, we have the quarter turn, right, which is March 31st, or I think it's March 29th this year, or 28th, because the 31st is on a weekend, weekend, whatever, it's this week at the last day of the quarter and there's typically a lot of book balancing and there's a lot of um there's a lot of liquidity sucking going on from different directions because banks want to make their balance sheet look perfect for the quarter or as perfect as they can be for whatever regulatory reason and then on top of that we have april 15th tax day and these are these are this very similar conditions to what led to the apocalypse of 2019 there was like there was uh, there was taxes from september 15th i think it was corporate tax day or one of the corporate tax days, and uh, there were other issues, but generally we saw like a, a three-pronged liquidity drain coming in from different directions, and we're seeing we're going to be seeing that, you know, not exactly on the same day because tax day is April fifteenth, and and the quarter end is March thirty first, and the bank term funding program is going to gradually end. Uh, so I I'm not saying there's definitely going to be a liquidity in, a liquidity um, instance uh, or um, incident. But there's a good possibility of one. And if it doesn't happen in April, it's just getting worse because QT continues and they keep shrinking the monetary base anyway. So we're going to take a giant leap forward to the next liquidity crunch if we don't hit it somewhere at some time. Rafi Farber's analysis goes beyond the surface to uncover the catalyst that could trigger Silver's dramatic ascent to $2,388. One of the key drivers he identifies is the mounting distrust in fiat currencies and the global financial system. This skepticism isn't unfounded, with central banks around the world engaging in unprecedented levels of quantitative easing. There's a growing apprehension about the long-term viability of traditional currency systems. Farber articulates this concern with clarity, emphasizing how these monetary policies have historically led to inflation and eroded the purchasing power of fiat currencies. The COVID-19 pandemic serves as a poignant example of this phenomenon. Governments and central banks responded to the economic fallout with massive stimulus packages, effectively flooding the market with new money. While these measures were designed to stabilize economies, they also highlighted the fragile nature of fiat currencies. Farber points out that this realization has led to a renewed interest in precious metals, including silver, as stores of value that can withstand the inflationary pressures that erode fiat currencies. Another significant factor that Farber discusses is the technological advancements and the green energy revolution. Silver's role in this sector cannot be overstated. It's a critical component in solar panels, electric vehicles, and various other technologies that are central to the transition towards renewable energy. As countries and corporations commit to reducing their carbon footprints, the demand for silver is expected to surge. Farber adeptly connects these dots, illustrating how the green energy revolution could serve as a major catalyst for silver's price explosion. Moreover, Farber sheds light on the geopolitical tensions that frequently influence commodity markets. Trade wars, sanctions, and political instability can disrupt supply chains and create uncertainty, driving investors towards safe haven assets like silver. He keenly observes that these tensions often result in increased demand for precious metals, as investors seek to hedge against the potential economic impact of geopolitical conflicts. In addition to these macroeconomic and geopolitical factors, Farber delves into the supply-side dynamics of the silver market. He notes that despite increasing demand, there's been a notable lack of investment in silver mining over the past decade. This underinvestment, coupled with the challenges of increasing production, sets the stage for a potential supply crunch. Farber's analysis highlights the delicate balance between supply and demand in the silver market, suggesting that any disruption could lead to significant price movements. Farber also addresses the role of market sentiment and investor behavior in driving silver prices. He points out that as more people become aware of silver's potential, both as an investment and as an industrial metal, the momentum could build, creating a self-reinforcing cycle that propels prices higher. This psychological aspect of the market is often overlooked, 
but Farber recognizes its importance in shaping price trends. Well, I've been looking at the at the COTs, the COTs, and I don't usually give these things that much credence because they can be they can be fudged, they can be manipulated. Uh, I've heard from several family offices that that all you got to do is like get a middleman that has a, a shell. And then, you know, have that shell company buy the contracts for you and you categorize as one thing instead of another thing. I'm sure this happens. I'm, I don't I don't think it's like um, it's pervasive to met to say that the numbers are completely made up and worthless, um, but they're, they're not perfect. Uh, but what I what I'm, you know, be that as it may, uh, what I am seeing is that open interest got off of uh, of. You know, I think it was a five-year low from back in 2019, and I was saying like it, I think it was about 400,000, 406, 407,000, and that was very, very low open interest, which means that, that all the all the 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 shorts had, had not all the shorts, but like the most shorts that would cover covered, and the longs are no longer interested. So this looks like a bottom to me. And since then, we've been on a rally, and open interest has gone up like uh, 130, 140,000 contracts. Uh, and it's mostly uh, it's mostly speculators, uh, hedge funds versus um, versus bullion banks, right? So it's not we're not seeing it in the retail market. We're not seeing it in uh, ETFs. ETFs are still losing gold. There might be some kind of connection there where the gold might be moving to the futures market to satisfy deliveries, but I, I can't prove that. Um, so uh, if the other thing that I pointed out, I remember, is that we were on some kind of uh, dividing line in the in the hedge fund longs uh, on the uh, in the futures market, and I remember seeing that from 2009 to 2011 to the gold top in 2011, we were consistently above about 540, 530 thousand contracts uh, in open interest, uh, or no, I think it was it was sorry, it was some other number. Uh, for specifically the hedge funds, and I don't remember exactly what the number is, but but we're we're at it now, wherever whatever it is. And in those two years, when gold just kept going up and up and up with very very minor pullbacks, we were consistently above that number in in hedge fund longs. And if we can stay above that number in hedge funds lo- hedge fund longs, then we're in a situ- we're in a similar situation where the big money is the one that's speculating and moving the price. And uh, hopefully the, the the stackers will not be too late to the party, and uh, not wait for the fervor to get really to a fever pitch before they take another. Rafi Farber highlights a significant aspect often overlooked in the discussion about silver's potential ascent: the growing interest in silver individual retirement accounts (IRAs) and the broader investment demand for silver. This increasing allure is not just a fleeting trend, but a reflection of deeper economic and financial shifts that savvy investors like Farber recognizes pivotal in driving silver prices to unprecedented levels. Silver IRAs represent a unique fusion of retirement planning and investment in tangible assets. These self-directed IRAs allow individuals to diversify their retirement portfolios by including silver, offering a hedge against inflation and market volatility. Farber points out that the allure of silver IRAs lies in their ability to combine the tax advantages of traditional retirement accounts with the intrinsic value and security of physical silver. As economic uncertainties mount, the appeal of silver IRAs is expected to grow, drawing more investors towards silver and potentially pushing its price higher. Furthermore, Farber delves into the broader investment demand for silver, beyond just IRAs. He notes that the investment landscape for silver is becoming increasingly dynamic, with various factors contributing to its attractiveness. One key factor is the metal's affordability compared to gold, making it accessible to a wider range of investors. This affordability, coupled with silver's historical role as a store of value, positions it as an attractive option for those looking to diversify their investment portfolios away from traditional stocks and bonds. Farber also underscores the significance of silver's industrial demand in shaping its investment appeal. As previously mentioned, silver's role in emerging technologies and green energy solutions adds a layer of growth potential that is appealing to investors. This dual appeal, both as a precious metal and an industrial commodity, enhances silver's attractiveness as an investment, suggesting a robust demand outlook that could drive prices up. Moreover, Farber touches on the psychological and behavioral aspects of investment demand for silver. He suggests that as more investors become aware of silver's potential and its role in a diversified portfolio, a bandwagon effect could occur, further amplifying demand. This social proof, where investors follow the lead of others, 
can play a significant role in investment markets, potentially contributing to rapid price movements in silver. In analyzing these factors, Farber presents a compelling case for the increasing investment demand for silver, driven by both traditional motives of diversification and hedging, as well as the modern appeal of investing in a metal crucial to technological advancements. But as a gold this substitute, growing demand, as a gold derivative, as it is now, in the context and then of silver you won't IRAs, have hyperinflation. Underscores a broader trend the system, towards tangible that, assets and an that's era gonna, of financial that's gonna cause uncertainty. Chaos, right? The other thing they could do is just keep printing because the the constant threat of financial collapse just keeps knocking on the door so they can't stop the printing and then and then they, they'll end up selling their gold reserves and then there there won't be any gold in the fed's balance sheet and then it will lead to hyperinflation the end of the dollar completely um i think that's the more healthy situation uh because that would also lead to chaos but it would at the same time, it would allow us to really reset everything on our own terms on a decentralized way, as opposed to a central power still having power within the currency, even though it is gold backed. Um, they would still have some semblance of power, which I don't want them to have because I've seen what they've done. Um, in terms of the second part of the question, uh, which is why hyperinflation would be faster in the United States <clears throat> rather than a drawn out process as we see in these other hyperinflationary countries, they have to think about what draws it out, right? And what and why is it that that the dollar um, is stronger than other currencies so much? Um, not the historical reasons, but why mechanically is it? Well, because in, in Argentina or any hyperinflationary country, what do they do, right? They their currency hyperinflates, and so they hoard dollars, and so the the United States gets to export its inflation to other countries that hoard the dollars to, so they can have a functioning currency to go to to survive. Right. So that 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 at the same time, that is the mechanism that makes the dollar stronger than other currencies and prolongs the hyperinflationary process in the other countries because they're still using currency. So they convert it back into their local currency when they need to buy food and then they go back to dollars. And so the peso still has some kind of a value and it's like everything's hobbling along like, you know, like a zombie for years. But when the, the dollar itself hyperinflates, it's not like when the, when the United States exports inflation to another country that hoards dollars, it's not like that inflation goes away. It's still there, right? And when the, when the dollar hyperinflates at home, then what happens to all these other countries that were hoarding dollars the whole time, and all of a sudden they see that the dollars aren't worth anything? Well, they reverse the process very quickly. They sell the dollars back to the United States, and everything that was exported, all the inflation that's been exported, just gets dumped onto U.S. shores very quickly, and then the, the, the dollar hyperinflates to nothing like that. I don't really know how fast it's going to be. I'm not saying it's going to be in seconds, but it's not going to be a, like years of drawn out 30, 40, 50 percent annual inflation. It's going to it's going to go up, up, up. And then just like wham, it's going to be. Rafi Farber intricately ties the predicted surge in silver prices to a broader narrative of the U.S. dollar's decline. This perspective is rooted in the understanding that the dollar's strength or lack thereof plays a crucial role in the dynamics of precious metals prices, including silver. Farber articulates how the weakening of the dollar spurred by domestic and international economic pressures, could catalyze a rush towards silver, further driving its price to unprecedented levels. The crux of Farber's argument lies in the expansive monetary policies adopted by the Federal Reserve, especially in response to economic crises. The printing of money, while a short-term measure to inject liquidity into the economy, has long-term implications for the value of the dollar. Farber points out that as the supply of dollars increases, its purchasing power diminishes, a classic scenario of inflation. This devaluation of the dollar heightens the appeal of tangible assets like silver, which retain intrinsic value and are not subject to the same inflationary pressures. Moreover, Farber discusses the international dimensions of the dollar's decline. With the dollar serving as the world's primary reserve currency, its health is of global concern. However, growing skepticism about the sustainability of the U.S. fiscal policies and the burgeoning national debt is leading other nations to reconsider their reliance on the dollar. Farber suggests that this shift could contribute to decreased demand for the dollar, further exacerbating its decline. This scenario sets the stage for a significant move towards silver and other precious metals. As Farber explains, investors and nations alike seek stable stores of value in times of currency devaluation. Silver, with its dual appeal as both an investment and industrial commodity, emerges as a prime candidate. The anticipated rush towards silver, driven by the dollar's decline, is expected to create a surge in demand that could dramatically elevate its price. Farmer also highlights the psychological impact of the dollar's weakening on investor behavior. The loss of confidence in fiat currencies prompts a search for safer alternatives, leading many to the precious metals market. 
This behavioral shift, according to Farber, is likely to be a significant driver of increased investment in silver, as both individual and institutional investors look to hedge against currency risk. Incorporating historical patterns into his analysis, Farber draws parallels with past periods of dollar weakness and subsequent rises in precious metals prices. He suggests that the current economic indicators and geopolitical tensions mirror those precursors, indicating that we may be on the cusp of a similar pattern. This historical context enriches Farber's prediction, providing a roadmap of what might be expected if the dollar continues its decline. Yeah, it's an opportunity, but it's also you have to understand how the how the price moves historically. And uh, it also helps to understand why from a, from a logical perspective, right? Gold, even in the 70s, gold was making new highs into 1977, 1978, and silver wasn't at all, right? In a, as gold was moving higher and higher and higher, it just it wasn't doing anything. And I've showed this chart in a few other interviews from 1975 to 1979, or, 19, or end of 1974, was it? it was like five years, silver did pretty much nothing. And gold was making new nominal highs every now and then and climbing. And then all of a sudden, just like 1979 to 1980, just silver went on a slingshot. But it's, that's not the first time it did it. It's not like that's the, the, the only time that silver did that when all gold was making new highs and silver just catches up at the end, right? It, ha it happened in 1918. It happened in 1968. Um, it, it's, this is how silver works uh, because from a logical perspective, as the trust in the derivative, the gold derivative breaks down – that it can no longer be redeemed for gold, that, then the public, which at that point cannot afford gold, they say, well, if the gold substitute, if the gold derivative, they're not saying this intellectually. They're saying if the, it, you know, in their behavior, if the gold derivative is breaking down, I got to get rid of these dollars, whether it be digital or central bank digital currencies or phys physical cash or whatever derivative it is, they got to get rid of them. And so they go after silver because that's the public's money. That's what they can afford. And then you have all this demand going in all at once when the public finally wakes up. And it's going to happen this time. And then when when it does, like uh, what I plan to do is move my silver into gold. Uh, and then and then it'll calm down and then I'll figure out what to do with, you know, with everything uh, and decide what to buy. Um, but you're, you're not going to have that much time. So you got You got to understand what silver is going to do. And when it does, and the number that I'm waiting for is around 15 to 1, 20 to 1 ratio, whatever the nominal numbers are, I don't know. I don't know what they'll be. But when it gets down to that ratio, I'm going to switch over. And you got to be... Rafa Farber delves deep into the intricacies of the silver supply chain, highlighting both the constraints that threaten its stability and the opportunities these challenges may present. He emphasizes that understanding the supply side of silver is critical for grasping why its price might soar to the levels he predicts. Farber meticulously outlines how issues such as mining difficulties, geopolitical tensions, and increased industrial demand are converging to create a perfect storm that could significantly tighten silver supply, thus driving prices upwards. Mining challenges stand at the forefront of Farber's analysis. He points out that silver mining is becoming increasingly difficult and costly due to factors such as depleting ore grades and stringent environmental regulations. These challenges not only raise the cost of silver production, but also limit the speed at which new supplies can enter the market. Farber notes that the silver mining sector has seen underinvestment in exploration and development for years, a trend that threatens to exacerbate supply constraints as demand continues to rise, particularly from industrial sectors. Geopolitical tensions are another critical factor affecting the silver supply chain. Farber highlights specific regions where silver mining operations face uncertainty due to political instability, regulatory changes, or labor disputes. These issues can lead to abrupt halts in production, further straining an already tight supply. Moreover, Farber discusses how trade policies and sanctions can disrupt the global flow of silver, creating bottlenecks and driving up prices. The industrial demand for silver, especially from the renewable energy and electronics sectors, is a significant part of Farber's thesis on silver's price potential. He explains that as economies worldwide shift towards greener technologies, the demand for silver, given its unparalleled conductive properties, is set to skyrocket. This increased demand, particularly for photovoltaic cells in solar panels and components in electric vehicles, presents both an opportunity and a challenge. While it underscores silver's indispensable role in modern technology, it also puts additional pressure on the supply chain, potentially outstripping mining output and recycling efforts. Farber also explores the role of recycling in the silver supply chain. He acknowledges that recycling is an important source of silver, especially from industrial offcuts and end-of-life electronics. However, Farber argues that recycling alone cannot meet the surging demand. 
The efficiency of recycling processes and the ability to recover silver from complex products are improving, but still face significant challenges. In his analysis, Farber suggests that these supply constraints offer a unique opportunity for investors and the industry. For investors, the tightening supply against a backdrop of rising demand could lead to substantial price gains for silver, making it an attractive investment option. For the industry, the challenges in the supply chain could spur innovation in mining technology and recycling processes, potentially making silver production more sustainable and efficient in the long run. Because if you go back to the repocalypse of September, was it September, September 17th, 2019? It was like, okay, so for, for a, a minute or a day or two, uh, interest rates went to 10%, but it's not like that immediately hits like prices on the shelves of your supermarket, right? It's it's down into the bowels of of the monetary system as deep as you can get. So what that led to is basically printing, I think it was like half a trillion dollars in the repo market overnight, and uh, eventually it it led to it led to the end of QT. It led to more money printing eventually with uh, the March 2020 incident that we all know about. And we can argue about whether it was connected or not. If you want to be conspiratorial, you can say, yeah, if you want to say it's coincidence, fine, whatever. But, you know, it, one way or another, it's going to lead to more money printing. So it would be the first, it would be the, the most immediate sign that the next money printing round is going to, going to happen, like in the next day or two, because you can't have 10% interest rates in the bowels of the monetary system for very long without everything tanking. So the, the Fed's going to print. And then we're going to see an explosion of commodity prices led by gold and silver if that happens. And it's going to happen. I don't know exactly if it's going to happen on April 15th, but it's going to happen soon. And, uh, and, and from then, from then we should be uh, you know, well into the final printing round. How long that's going to take? I don't think it's going to take that long. Rafi Farber's comprehensive outlook on silver. He delves into the inflationary backdrop that's been unfolding globally and positions silver not just as a mere investment, but as a critical hedge against the eroding purchasing power caused by inflation. This perspective is key to understanding why Farber sees silver skyrocketing to $2,388 as inflation concerns become more pronounced and investors seek refuge in tangible assets. Farber meticulously outlines how years of loose monetary policies, including record low interest rates and quantitative easing, have set the stage for significant inflationary pressures. He draws attention to the fact that these policies, initially deployed to combat economic downturns, have led to an oversupply of fiat currency, diminishing its value and purchasing power over time. This scenario, Farber argues, makes a compelling case for silver, which, unlike fiat currencies, maintains intrinsic value due to its scarcity and utility. Highlighting historical precedents, Farber points out that silver has traditionally served as a hedge against inflation. During periods of high inflation, Silver prices have often risen, reflecting its role as a store of value. Farber emphasizes that silver's dual appeal, both as a precious metal and an industrial commodity, enhances its resilience against inflation. While its status as a precious metal provides a safe haven for investors, its industrial demand underpins its fundamental value, making it less susceptible to inflationary devaluation compared to purely speculative assets. Furthermore, Farber explores the psychological impact of inflation on investor behavior. He suggests that as inflation becomes more tangible to the average consumer, seen through rising costs of goods and services, the shift towards assets like silver becomes more pronounced. This behavioral shift, driven by the desire to preserve wealth, could significantly increase demand for silver, putting upward pressure on its price. Farber also considers the potential for stagflation, a scenario where inflation and economic stagnation occur simultaneously. In such an environment, traditional investments like stocks and bonds may underperform due to economic headwinds, while inflation erodes real returns. Farber posits that silver could outshine other assets in stagflation, as it benefits from both its safe haven status and industrial demand, which may remain robust due to its applications in technology and renewable energy sectors. In analyzing these factors, Farber doesn't just present silver as an option for speculative gains. He frames it as a necessity for preserving wealth in an increasingly inflationary world. This nuanced understanding of silver's role in an investment portfolio underscores its potential for significant appreciation in value. There's, a, there's been a nominal rise in prices, yes, that's true. Uh, but if you look at gold relative to the CRB index, to all commodities, it's not doing any better than any other commodity uh, on average, especially like, you know, look at cocoa. Cocoa is in, uh, in a parabolic move now and it's in deep backwardation 
for uh, for industrial reasons, shortages, weather, famine uh, in Africa, you know, all kinds of stuff happens there and we're not really tracking it. So um, it, it might be specific to cocoa, but uh, but across the board, all commodities are rising. And really the, the peak, uh, the, the all time high for gold. Right. And this is this is also difficult to internalize and accept but it's the truth it's the truth when did gold have its highest purchasing power in terms of other commodities when was its real purchasing power at an all-time high that was in march 16th 2020 right that was what that was like at the depth of that crazy crash when gold went from like 1750 or whatever 1800 to 1450 and all the gold bugs well everything's crashing even gold is crashing but the truth is that gold was crashing the least of all commodities and if you remember, at that point, oil was crashing so badly that it went negative, <laughs> and and all other commodities were were like just plummeting. So that that was the peak of the gold bull market in all of history that day, even though it felt like gold was crashing. So what what we're gonna see this time is uh, because the Fed the Fed wasn't exactly printing on March 16th. It took time for the 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 pipes to start flowing. Right. But this time they have their finger on the trigger like immediately. And the so we're we're going to see some kind of a, a crash like that again. Right. When when we're talking about the plumbing blow up, blow up in the, in the sewers, the monetary sewers. And then immediately the Fed's going to print and then everything's going to reverse instead of taking what was it like a week or two in March 2020. It's going to take like a day or two this time. But the, the move down is going to be even more extreme and the move up is going to be even more extreme. And the Rafi Farber's exploration into the factors propelling silver to potentially reach $2,388. He delves into the digital revolution and how it's reshaping the demand for silver. This aspect of his analysis is crucial for understanding silver's unique position in the nexus of traditional value and modern utility. Farber argues that the accelerating pace of technological advancement and the digital transformation of economies globally are not just peripheral factors but central drivers of silver's future price trajectory. Farber outlines how the digital revolution, characterized by the rapid growth of technologies such as 5G, renewable energy, and electric vehicles EVDs, relies significantly on silver due to its unmatched electrical conductivity. He highlights that each of these technologies requires substantial amounts of silver for their operation, from photovoltaic cells and solar panels to conductive elements in EVs and electronic devices. This burgeoning demand places silver at the heart of the digital and green transitions underpinning its value beyond just its historical role as a store of wealth. Moreover, Farmer explores the implications of the digital economy's expansion on silver demand, particularly in the context of the Internet of Things, IoT, and wearable technology. These emerging technologies, which integrate digital capabilities into the physical world, often utilize silver for their electrical contacts and conductive paths. Farber suggests that as these technologies become more pervasive, Silver's industrial demand is set to increase, potentially outstripping current supply projections and exerting upward pressure on prices. Farber also discusses the role of silver in the development and deployment of green technologies, particularly in energy generation and storage. He notes that the global push towards sustainability and carbon neutrality has led to increased investment in renewable energy sources, where silver plays a critical role. The metal's importance in solar panels and other renewable energy technologies not only highlights its industrial value, but also aligns silver investment with broader environmental and social governance ESG trends, attracting a new demographic of socially conscious investors to the silver market. In addition to the direct demand from these technologies, Farber touches on the secondary effects of the digital revolution on silver demand. He posits that as digital technologies facilitate more efficient marketplaces and enhance the transparency of supply chains, they could lead to more nuanced understanding and valuation of precious metals like silver. This increased visibility may further boost investor confidence in silver, contributing to its price momentum. In summarizing this step of his analysis, Farber effectively bridges the gap between silver's historical allure and its future potential in the digital age. By highlighting silver's indispensable role in powering and enabling the technologies of tomorrow, Farber not only reinforces the case for silver's value appreciation, but also positions it as a strategic asset in the portfolios of forward-thinking investors. As the digital revolution continues to unfold, the insights from this step of Farber's analysis underscore the multifaceted drivers of silver demand. This comprehensive view not only supports his bullish stance on silver prices, 
but also so offers a nuanced your first perspective point on how technological advancements that, and sustainability efforts could shape the future um, of the silver that, market. Uh, the, the, the end of the dollar and hyperinflation, right? So I, I come from an Austrian perspective, not in terms of uh, Austrian school of economics specifically, but in terms of analyzing economics from a standpoint of logic and only secondarily from empirical evidence, right? So I'm not, I'm not going to quote historical precedent of this hyperinflation, that hyperinflation to say the same thing will happen to the dollar and therefore that's my proof, right? Even though I, I would cite it as evidence, like this happened there, this happened there, it could happen here, right? So that, that makes sense, but that's not my argument. Um, my, my argument on the hyperinflation of the dollar is that if it does, if it does hyperinflate and there's no other currency to go to, right? There's, there, you, it's not like Americans can just get euros instead of the dollar and then start spending in euros or something like the like the um, like the Argentinians do they hoard dollars because they're trying to keep their savings and so they they kind of step down the pyramid from their dollar derivative which is the peso and going to the the the, the, the structural level below that in the inverted pyramid which is the dollar but you have in order to step off the mountain or step off the pyramid you have to go down a layer right uh, otherwise if you go up a layer you're just going to get worse so the only way, the, the only thing down a layer from the U.S. dollar in the pyramid is gold and silver. That's the only thing that's there. There's nothing else uh, because it, in, this kind of this leads into the second question. Um, but before I get before I get to that, I mean, look, there's two possibilities here, just logically. Either on on a hyperinflationary spiral, the the uh, the Fed or the Treasury, whoever owns the the gold reserves of the United States could say something like, okay, we're freezing the gold price here. The dollar is going to be convertible again. It's going to be, let's say, $35,000 an ounce. And then we're just going to lock off, lop off three zeros and we're back to 1971. It's going to be the new dollar, gold backed dollar. That, I mean, that would, that would be very serious, uh, meaning that everyone who profits off of inflation, which is pretty much the entire world, would have to restructure their, the global economy very, very quickly, which would lead to riots and, and, and very uncomfortable things, especially in Rafi Farber's analysis, he turns his focus toward the market dynamics and speculative potential surrounding silver, adding another layer of complexity to his prediction of silver reaching $2,388. Farber dissects the interplay between investor sentiment, speculative activity, and market liquidity to illustrate how these factors could serve as catalysts for a dramatic increase in silver prices. Farber points out that the silver market, known for its volatility, attracts a significant amount of speculative interest. This characteristic, while adding to price fluctuations, also contributes to the metal's potential for rapid price appreciation. He highlights how speculative activities, driven by expectations of future price increases, can lead to short-term buying frenzies that significantly impact the market. Farber suggests that as more investors become aware of silver's fundamental value and its role in the digital and green revolutions, speculative interest is likely to increase, potentially leading to sharp upward movements in price. Moreover, Farber explores the concept of market liquidity and its impact on silver prices. The silver market. And we saw hints of it in 2020, right? What everyone thought was a bear, it was a, you know, a bear uh, plunge when gold and silver, and I think silver went down to $11, some crazy number like that. But like in the spot market, yeah, but the premiums were like, what, 30, 40% or something. So the price wasn't really going down on the demand. And, and uh, I, I'm sure Miles Franklin, I've heard Andy talk about this uh, in 2020, like it was, uh, there were back orders and, and it took time for orders to get fulfilled. And uh, it was the same with Peter Schiff, I remember, I talked to him about it. So we saw that for a few weeks, it was hard to get orders filled and, and to lock in, uh, in, locking in prices, but like, thank God they were able to do that, but it took a while. So in, in the end game, or as we lead up to it, that's what's going to happen. Uh, there's going, it's going to be more and more, more and more difficult to fulfill orders. The hedging through the futures market isn't going to work as well, and things are going to start breaking down. Uh, and except instead of for a few weeks, it's going to break down and it's not going to come back. And it's at that point that I think that the the coin shops and the retailers um, will just keep their stacks and just flip to being banks and make loans uh, of of real money. Um, that's how, that's I don't see any other way. Like, what else are they going to do if they can't get product? They can't sell product. Okay, so then they'll just keep what they have and and I don't know coalesce into some kind of banking system. 
That'll be a gold and silver backed banking system. Just the infrastructure is already there. That's what a coin shop is. A bank is just a coin shop, right? But without any money in it. <laughs> so it's just collections of money. That's what they are. It's all the same thing. It just depends how you look at it. So once you flip everything over, then you start over, but you have the same infrastructure. And what you said before is that that that's what really differentiates me from, I wouldn't say every single other gold and silver analyst out there, but what, but my way of sticking out is I disagree with the assertion that money is no longer backed by gold. It's not statutorily, but the fact that there's still an exchange rate is the convertibility. That when you go to a coin shop, when you go to Miles Frank and you buy a gold coin, you buy a silver coin, that is the gold standard, right? The problem is, it's just, it's, it's at the jewelry price. It's not at the money price. The money price is the price where if everybody wanted to hand in all of their fiat for all the gold they can get, what would that exchange rate be? It's there. It's somewhere. It's a, there's a number that's there. I don't know what it is. I just know that the futures market is the jewelry price. Rafi Farber's analysis, he turns his focus toward the market dynamics and speculative potential surrounding silver, adding another layer of complexity to his prediction of silver reaching $2,388. Farber dissects the interplay between investor sentiment, speculative activity, and market liquidity to illustrate how these factors could serve as catalysts for a dramatic increase in silver prices. Farber points out that the silver market, known for its volatility, attracts a significant amount of speculative interest. This characteristic, while adding to price fluctuations, also contributes to the metal's potential for rapid price appreciation. He highlights how speculative activities, driven by expectations of future price increases, can lead to short-term buying frenzies that significantly impact the market. Farber suggests that as more investors become aware of silver's fundamental value and its role in the digital and green revolutions, speculative interest is likely to increase, potentially leading to sharp upward movements in price. Moreover, Farber explores the concept of market liquidity and its impact on silver prices. The silver market, smaller in comparison to other commodities like gold, is susceptible to liquidity crunches that can exacerbate price movements. Farber explains that in periods of high demand, especially when fueled by speculative buying, the market's liquidity can dry up, leading to significant price spikes. He posits that as investment and industrial demand for silver continue to grow, these liquidity challenges could become more pronounced, further enhancing silver's speculative appeal. Another critical aspect Farber addresses is the role of investor sentiment in the silver market. He argues that sentiment plays a crucial role in driving speculative activity, with positive sentiment amplifying speculative buying and vice versa. Farber notes that sentiment can be influenced by a range of factors, from macroeconomic indicators and inflation expectations to geopolitical events. As sentiment shifts toward a more bullish outlook on silver, driven by the factors outlined in previous steps of his analysis, the market could see an influx of speculative capital, driving prices higher. Farber also examines the impact of derivatives markets, such as futures and options, on silver's price dynamics. He suggests that the leverage available in these markets can magnify the impact of speculative trades, leading to more pronounced price movements. As investors and speculators use these instruments to bet on silver's future price direction, the potential for rapid gains or losses increases, attracting more participants to the silver market and adding to its volatility. Rafi Farber's thorough examination of the factors that could propel silver to remarkable heights, he scrutinizes the impact of escalating geopolitical tensions on silver's role as a safe haven asset. Farber elucidates how geopolitical uncertainties and conflicts have historically driven investors towards precious metals, with silver standing out not only for its wealth preservation qualities, but also for its industrial relevance. Farber identifies several global hotspots and conflicts that have the potential to disrupt economic stability and foster a climate of uncertainty. He points out that in times of geopolitical strife, the intrinsic human tendency is to seek security in tangible assets that have stood the test of time. Silver, with its dual appeal as both an industrial commodity and a precious metal, uniquely positions itself as an attractive option for those looking to hedge against geopolitical risks. Drawing from historical precedents, Farber notes that silver prices have often seen upticks in response to international tensions and crises. This pattern, he argues, is indicative of silver's perceived value as a safe haven during turbulent times. He delves into specific examples where silver and other precious metals experience significant price movements in correlation with geopolitical events, underlining the reactive nature of the silver market to global uncertainties. 
Furthermore, Farber explores the concept of geopolitical inflation, where the anticipation or the actual onset of geopolitical events leads to increased investment in silver and other precious metals, driving up prices. He suggests that the current geopolitical landscape, marked by contentious trade relations, regional conflicts, and the resurgence of nationalism, could exacerbate this phenomenon. As tensions escalate, the flight to safety could intensify demand for silver, thereby amplifying its price. Farber also considers the implications of supply chain disruptions resulting from geopolitical tensions. He highlights how conflicts and sanctions can impede the flow of silver, affecting its availability and, consequently, its price. The fragility of global supply chains, as exposed by recent events, underscores the potential for geopolitical developments to significantly impact silver production and distribution, adding another layer of complexity to the market dynamics. In synthesizing these insights, Farber posits that the convergence of geopolitical tensions and the search for reliable safe haven assets could significantly bolster silver's appeal to investors. He articulates a scenario where silver's price is not merely reactive to immediate geopolitical events, but is also reflective of a broader shift towards assets that offer both security and utility in an uncertain world. In the final step of Rafi Farber's in-depth analysis, he synthesizes the multitude of factors previously discussed ranging from inflationary pressures and the digital revolution to geopolitical tensions and market dynamics, into a cohesive argument for how silver could potentially reach the unprecedented price of $2,388. Farber presents a compelling narrative that weaves together these diverse strands, illustrating a clear path that could lead silver to such heights. This culmination not only underscores the complexity of the forces at play, but also highlights Farber's adept understanding of the interconnected nature of global economics, technological advancements, and investor psychology. Farber reiterates the critical role of inflationary pressures, exacerbated by loose monetary policies worldwide, in diminishing the purchasing power of fiat currencies. He points out that this erosion of value drives investors towards tangible assets like silver, known for its historical role as a store of wealth. As inflation continues to loom large on the economic horizon, Farber suggests that the appeal of silver as a hedge against inflation will only grow stronger drawing in more investors and pushing prices up. The digital revolution and the increasing demand for silver in technological applications provide another pillar in Farber's argument. He emphasizes how silver's indispensable role in emerging technologies, especially in green energy solutions and electronics, underpins its fundamental value. As the world shifts towards sustainability and digitalization, the demand for silver is set to rise, potentially outpacing current supply levels and contributing to upward price pressure. Farber also revisits the significance of geopolitical tensions and their impact on the silver market. He argues that geopolitical uncertainties often lead to a flight to safety among investors, with silver standing out as a preferred safe haven asset. This dynamic, coupled with potential disruptions in silver supply due to geopolitical conflicts, could further tighten the market and elevate prices. Moreover, Farber delves into the speculative potential of silver, driven by market dynamics and investor sentiment. He posits that speculative interest, fueled by expectations of future price increases, and the leverage available in derivatives markets, can lead to rapid price appreciation. As more investors become aware of the factors supporting silver's upward trajectory, speculative activity is likely to increase, adding momentum to price movements. In weaving together these diverse factors, Farber paints a picture of a silver market poised for significant change. He articulates a scenario where the convergence of inflationary pressures, technological demand, geopolitical risks, and speculative dynamics creates a perfect storm for silver prices to soar. This comprehensive analysis not only highlights the potential for substantial gains in silver, but also underscores the importance of understanding the multifaceted nature of commodity markets. Farber's analysis offers a holistic view of the path to $2,388 silver, grounded in a deep understanding of economic and market principles. By carefully considering a wide range of factors that influence the silver market, Farber provides a nuanced and well-supported prediction for its future. As the global economic landscape continues to evolve, the insights from Farber's analysis serve as a valuable guide for investors navigating the complexities of the silver market, highlighting the opportunities that lie ahead in the face of uncertainty.